All right, and we're live. Matt, how's it going? Every day I wake up and I say, WWTD, what would Tevis do? And oh, that's he's, a, he's, he's whipping out the Celsius. I, you, you, it's a fresh crack. What flavor? Give us a, oh, yeah. give us the, it's, it's the, dude, we, we don't get enough flavors here in Canada. We get a variety pack of three flavors. I think total in Canada, I've only seen five flavors, mm. and that's it. We don't have the you know gazillion flavors that you guys have. We're lucky we have the freaking drink in the first place, okay? Like we're we're lucky they are importing it up here in the first place. So yeah, I don't I don't. Well, have I would it, um, if I wasn't wearing tidy whities, um, you know, speedo underwear, then I would go to my fridge behind me and I'd, I'd show you the the real flavors. But uh, yeah, I don't want to. Uh, upset people and and if even if i didn't upset people they'd have to pay you know yeah. so that's that special show but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll i'll reel it in i know you try to keep it professional i don't give a shit dude honestly uh <laughs> and they started talking about shift four that's the best advertisement that he can make to bring people onto this <laughs> podcast i think so <laughs> um uh, i don't even know what shift four is i'm out exactly. of the yeah, I don't. I don't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh man, Tanner does a good job over there. He does a really yeah, good job. Yeah, I was just watching his stream right before. He was really interactive out. with the with the stream. So if you guys don't follow up, make sure to make sure to do that. But we talked a bit a little bit about topics beforehand. Uh, I'll let you drive it. Uh, Bootleg Weekly. I'm excited. This is my second. Um, Bootleg Weekly. And I paid Captain Crunch to say that. So your your checks in the mail, my guy. <laughs> Um, yeah, bullet, yeah. so we have a bunch of topics. We were talking about it um, backstage of what we want to chat about this week. I mean, full disclosure, I was like out. I just got home like 30 minutes ago, so I wasn't really prepared for this show. Uh, but luckily, we have Matt to distract you all with his good looks. Um, we want to talk a little bit about some Google, Microsoft, um, Tesla, Matt, I know you're not in Tesla right now, but still interesting what happened. I mean, I think maybe we start with that. And we also want to talk about maybe some dividends, definitely some SoFi, because you are in that, and we can talk about that. You but owe me money. <laughs> I don't owe you money, motherfucker. Like, I don't owe you anything, okay? You <laughs> I know, I know. I know. Just, I'll give you shit until it gets green. <laughs> Hold on. What I told you was it's going to go to 10. I didn't say when. I didn't promise a time. It's a good store of capital. I'm just giving you crap. You should buy more. On why don't you buy more? Uh, I'm, well, I told you a little bit about this backstage. I'm trying to buy another rental property, but uh, who knows what the hell is going to happen with that? Because um, anyway, yes, buy the Rocket Lab dip. I'm I'm with this guy. Hot George knows. He's uh, Hot George knows. He's, he's, Hot George is an avid member. Of the Maddie Moolah channel, he knows all about it. Yeah, I haven't convinced you yet, but one day you'll be like, "Man, this Mac guy was right on Rocket Lab." Hey, man, I hope you're right on Rocket Lab. Me too. I have about like a hundred grand in it, so. See, <laughs> 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 so there, I lose a hundred grand, or you know, you guys will literally see me fly to the to Mars with Elon. So, I'm the tip. I uh, yeah, and I really hope you're right with the Rocket Lab. <laughs> That's, that's just money. Yeah, that, that's true. I just need to once, and we can pay for vacations for like the next twenty years. Every every day we have a red day. I'm just like, I look at the amount that I'm losing that day, and I'm just, you know, it's just pieces of paper. It's numbers on a screen. It's a social construct. Go outside. It's it'll be fine. Yeah, when when the market was down a little bit yesterday, it wasn't even that bad. I think I was down like 15, 20 grand, and I was just like. I've been down double this before. It's not that big of a deal. I um so segue and then we can get into the topics. I have a friend and well, that's they're tough. they're like a I know my only one. <laughs> and they're like a lifetime saver, but they never invested. And uh, I was I was chatting with them and I was trying to convince them to jump into investments. And what I did was I bait, they showed me their account and they had like 130K, something like that. Yeah. In their account. And I was like, what the heck? 
guess what, Matt? This thing was in a savings account earning one and a half percent. That's it. And so what I did was I transferred um, her entire accounts into the the Roth and the IRA. And then I put the 90K in SPY and I put the remaining 35K, whatever she uh, they had in the, um, the, the long-term retirement account. I put that all in QQQ. So I basically split SPY QQQ and I was getting messages today like, I'm down 2K. What the heck is this bullshit? And I'm like, <laughs> calm down. You're going to get a dividend with SPY. Just hold it for a year plus and it, like, everything will be okay. Meanwhile, they were in the savings account for six years and their entire performance was completely flat since 2018. That's and it really just sad. like, I, really I just, man, I don't understand some. I get it. It's just crazy to see in real life, like a real life example of somebody doing that because you just look at this account and it's like all time performance, you know, 2% or whatever over six years. It's ridiculous. Uh, anyway, so the point is, I said, this is the safest thing that you could possibly in. Here's three quarters in SPY, a quarter in QQQ and just chill. Uh, and they were freaking out the first red day that they had because today was a red day. Well, very, very similar story. So I was out hanging out at the beach house for the first time. First time I was actually able to stay there. So it's nice to be there. Mm -hmm. um, I've had hundreds of people stay there. I haven't even stayed there a night. So it was nice to actually be able to get there. But uh, brought my sister, my brother-in-law, my two nephews, my niece. It was a great time. Uh, they got a little bit on my nerves at one point just because I'm single and they're a pretty rowdy, uh, rambunctious group of kids. But other than that, we, we I promised my nephew, I said... He, I think he made a couple hundred bucks. He did some like uh, dog sitting or something like that. Right. And his dad was just like, I have this hundred dollars and I want to invest for you. And I said, invest it in Bitcoin. I said, if in six years by like 2032 or whatever, it is less than a hundred dollars. I was like, I will gladly pay you a hundred dollars in cash. Um, and we did it. So I think they bought, I forget what, I don't know if it was IB, IBIT or whatever. One of the, um, crypto ETFs. And uh, the first day it was down like a dollar 50 or something like that. He's like, what the heck is this? And I'm like, you're down less than a percent, my guy, like you're perfectly fine. It's, like, it's a long term thing. You right. know, but I think it's going to be very difficult for this younger generation that's used to things being so quick, like, at least right. me and you, I mean, you're a little bit younger than me. But even me and you, like, we didn't always have smartphones at our ready disposal, we, you know, PCs, laptops have really just become more of a phenomenon. Well, PCs have always been kind of around since I've been alive, but laptops and tablets, et cetera, have always have kind of been growing with popularity over the past decade or so. So it's like, at least we've seen a little bit of like uh, what it's like not to have these sort of very mobile devices and we've kind of grown into them and using them. Uh, but these kids are so used to having things so readily available now um they don't have an understanding of what like patience is right yeah i think it's a mixture of different things and i mean like we're sort of you know in this conversation now um you know i think it's a mixture of different things it's a mixture of the low like the instant gratification number one and then the second thing what i see a lot and i have people i have one gen z on my team uh, that reports into me and then the rest of them are uh, millennials mostly and the gen, it's just so crazy, man, because like I, I was on a one-on-one -on -one with her earlier today and they just like, it feels as though they're so disenfranchised and pessimistic about the future. And the millennials are still under that idea of if I work very hard, yes, the odds are stacked against my favor today more so than they were 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Absolutely. It's tougher out there, but you can still make it by working hard. The future can still be good. I can still have a good life. Like there's still have that idea. Whereas the Gen Z one that I talked to, you know, it's just, there's a lack of motivation, a lack of willingness to work hard and put in the time and actually, you know, have that dedication to a craft, have that sense of responsibility and put in hard work and be proud of that hard work. And as a result, like I'm seeing so many of my 
friends even around me. Like they just don't want to have kids. I was having a conversation literally earlier tonight and they were saying, oh, I don't want to have kids because it's a fucked up world out there. I don't want to bring kids. In. And I was like, how is that going to change if your response is, is negative? And so my point is, is once you have all of those things, the instant gratification, uh, the lack of education around investing, and you mix that with a general pessimism, like you have to be optimistic to put the majority of your net worth into the like even ETFs, right? Because you have to be bullish on the prospects of tomorrow being better than the prospects of today. Yep. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really good way to put it. And I just don't see it, you know, like it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, it makes me sad. And I've, I've had to do that a very similar I mean, you did it for Bitcoin. I did it for so fun. So I might end up paying someone. But, um, you know, I had to do a very similar thing because, you know, I had family members, friends, um, close relationships, that kind of stuff where they just kept money, like literally under the mattress in the savings account, whatever. And that was it. It was like their nest egg of 10K or 5K or whatever. And I honestly have pushed if there was a referral bonus for how many people i've convinced to go into sofi like i would be swimming in it um because everybody around me knows that i talk about it consistently that i know everything there is to know about that company whatever it may be you know even bitcoin or tesla or anything else and for so, so many people it's still been so difficult to convince them to say hey i have significantly more than you will put in this company like if you're really debating over that 5k and i sleep fine at night and i've been making content about this company for three years i'm you know whatever and i and i'm still very confident in it and they're like well i don't know like i might lose the 5k and i'm like you've been keeping it so close to your chest you know in a savings account for like five years like just risk it man like it's just wild to me it's it's a diatribe but it's crazy yeah it's um I think I used to, I think it's a lack of education. So people in the chat are saying that I agree. I think the thing that I recognize and I, I continue to recognize even more so every day, the more wealth I accumulate, the more I'm like, just risk it on, you know? And I used to be so risk averse. I used to be, because I saw, I saw literally people get chopped off at the knee within six to 12 months of me starting in, in my, my career in the oil industry, you know, I started in late 2014, early 2015, but by that time, um, people were, sorry, I started in late 2013 by late 2014, people were already starting to get laid off 2015. Everybody was in a huge panic. Companies were downsizing like crazy going bankrupt, etc. Venezuela was going to shit, like all that sort of crap, uh, associated with the oil industry. And, it terrified me. Here I am, a 22, 23 year old kid being like, I'm joining this oil industry, fat, dumb, and happy, you know, making a six figure salary. I thought I had the world by the nuts. And here I am seeing people literally lose, lose their livelihoods right in front of my very eyes. And so it was, it was kind of a rude awakening. And that put me in a very risk averse sort of situation for five, six years until I really was able to kind of come out of it on the other end. And um, I think a lot of that was educating myself. I think a lot of that was realizing that the world is consistently expanding and investing and continuing to innovate. And if you're not a part of that, you're going to turn into a dinosaur, just like a lot of these other companies do. So I learned a lot about money during that six years. I lost, you know, my tuition's worth of uh, opportunity cost and, you know, probably several hundred thousand dollars worth of um, opportunity costs lost by just not investing in things like Apple or Tesla or just even the S&P 500, where I'd be focusing so much on high yield dividend paying companies. And um, instead, I should have been focusing on Google and Amazon and, and things like that. But you know what, Matt, it's honestly like, you know, I agree with the chat. It is an education thing, um, you know, hesitant to change all that stuff. And yes, I do know Anthony Nova's middle name is Joseph. Um, like I know this company a lot. Um, but you know, I, I think that it's also a dipping your toes in type of thing. And I've realized this for myself as well. When I was first getting started, I was like, oh wow, I want to be able, and like I was so risk averse. 
And now I'm so risk, you know, prone, uh, not sensitive to that risk at all, because you just realize that there's nothing to be really fearful of. And even in this situation, like I would never, if it's their first time, because I know that they're going to be very skittish, even if they see a 5% or a 10% dip, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is the worst decision ever. I'm going to go bankrupt. This is my life savings. What did you do to me? You know? And so I would never recommend individual stocks for these people. I would just say, go into the spy and then just chill. But what I find is after they do that, they see the gains and they get into that habit of consistently putting money. Like I just rerouted, you know, for my friend, I just rerouted their uh, automatic deposit. Uh, it was every two weeks or whatever from the savings account to the investment account and just have like a, a consistent investment in the spy. And I guarantee you it's going to be the same for this one as it was for, you know, family members and other friends that I've gotten into the market. It's they get into the habit and they can see the account value slowly going up over time. They see progress. And once they see progress, then they're like, okay, they have a higher willingness to learn. And as a result of that, they have a higher sort of satisfaction overall around that education because they, they can see it in action. It's not just theory on the textbook somewhere. It's in practice. No, that's a, that's a good way to put it. It's a really good way to put it. Yeah, I think you can study as much as you want, paper trade and, and do all that. And I think some people recommend doing that stuff. But yeah, sometimes it literally just takes losing a little bit of money, making some mistakes and getting that experience before you can really truly land on on your feet. And reflection, I think, is something that people need to recognize, right? Recognize you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. I think that that's something I really struggled with i talked about this with chris immensely last night it was like you know you learn a little bit about dividends you learn a little bit about price to earnings ratios then you think i figured it out right i figured out because you hit this this learning curve right where you're like i know nothing versus now you're like oh i can kind of read and and value a company kind of right and now you feel like because i can evaluate a company somewhat that i can evaluate all companies because all companies should be valued that way and then you make a tumble, Co company cuts its dividend, or it gets cut in half because of the valuations, or then you start to realize is like, not all companies are valued the same. Some metrics are different than others. You know, monthly active users is important for some companies, but doesn't mean shit for others. Um, and just like operating efficiency means a lot for oil and gas companies, but doesn't mean anything probably for, for some other companies that are out there. So you start to get a little bit in tune with what matters for different industries. And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there's going to be a series of local tops in your education, uh, local maximums, you know, and there's going to be learning along the way, but at least you get started into that process. And I think, you know, to answer this question, you know, why do you guys care so much whether Gen Z is investing or not? It's because the earlier you start, the better it is. And it's just, there's a lot of people that, I mean, myself included, like I got started a little bit later. Uh, still not late, but later than I probably should have. And a lot of that was a lack of education out there, a lack of options to learn about this stuff. It wasn't readily, you know, available. I had to go seek it out proactively. And so uh, there's a lot of people that might have the desire, but might not know the, the way to go seek that information out. And by the time that they do, let's say 10 years in the future, they're going to start and they're going to get in the habit and that consistency, but they're going to have missed out on that time. And so that opportunity cost of that time, I think, is something worthy of mentioning because ultimately, I, you know, I do think it's something where younger generations have to be more optimistic about the future. Um, and that forms a foundation. But I think the main point that I'm trying to make is that just by getting started, you're almost treating it as you know this is the the first lesson and I'm, I'm iterating on that consistently and i'm learning more as i do it it's 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 theory and practice right um but with that said just so that we, we don't harp on that too much i saw some people saying that uh, my recommendation to buy spy and qqq um, might have been bad timing so i want us to pivot matt into the market powell made comments uh, recently on cuts and basically telegraphing that, you know, 
we're going to wait to see how the data pans out. I think January and February showed some inflation numbers uh, increasing or the, the signs weren't as positive. I saw a CNBC last call uh, interview earlier today with Tom Lee, uh, basically saying that, hey, this data is seasonal. Uh, March numbers in Europe are showing that you know these numbers are falling. Inflation is still falling. And Tom Lee, I mean, the token bull, he believes that there's going to be more than three cuts this year. There's also a chance that there's fewer than three cuts. I think the market is pricing at three cuts this year. What do you make of all of it? Are we having three cuts? Three, I think, might still be tough. But I, I, I do believe there will be a cut at a minimum. Uh, I think it's just too... Um, what I think you can say is everything's trending in the right direction, right? I never expected it to go from five to five and a quarter, or I guess maybe it's five and a quarter to five and a half right now for say the federal funds rate in the United States. I don't know what it is up in Maple land, but, um, but, uh, I never expected it to go from five and a half down to 2% in the matter of a year, right? I think it's it's going to be a drawn out process that I think even with the Fed being optimistic was going to take at least two to two and a half years. And I think that we're going to end up more in the high threes rather than say the five, five and a half percent. Um, and so uh, that that's just kind of my thought process. I, I've always kind of thought that it was interesting how 2% meant 2% before, and then it was kind of like indications of 2%. So they kind of came off and became more dovish in that respect uh, to, to allow people to maybe get a little bit more happy, which is why I think we've been on such a rally for the past six months. Um, but now I think the, the reality is kind of setting in that, you know, maybe things aren't as great as we kind of let on and maybe the the collar needs to be choked up a little bit more but in terms of like huge reinflation numbers i mean i love chris to death chris patel but he's trying to fear people into thinking that because oil prices went from 80 to 85 dollars a barrel that inflation's going to start skyrocketing in the other direction i think it's very much like a an interesting topic. If you look in the past year, which is what CPI is based off of, right? The last trailing 12 months, year over year sort of inflation numbers, oil was still at $84, $85 a barrel for WTI. So it's not like you're in a massively different state than you were a year ago. Yes, when it comes to the April, May timeframe, um, maybe it's more like the May, June timeframe, oil prices did creep down into the low 70s. But they didn't stay there for very long. In the summer time frame of last year, oil crept up back to the ninety dollars range. So it's not like I think you're going to see a massive, you know, growth in energy costs or travel costs, at least. Um, you know, from an oil and gas perspective, natural gas is still, you know, at a very, um, very long term low, below two dollars in MCF, which is what it was back in like the 2012, 2013 timeframe. So that is still really, really cheap. So it just doesn't make sense why people are thinking that from an oil and gas perspective, things are going up. I also have seen rent and housing come down slightly. Um, you know, in my area, things were renting for 24 to 2,500. I just saw the house down the street rent for 2,200. So you've seen a decrease of about 10 to 15% in that. Um you know, things have kind of come back to normal. And I think not to say that they won't kick off again when you have interest rate cuts, but I think, you know, it really depends on what you're looking for. I also st saw that the gentleman said that probably the wrong time to buy SPY in the queues. I mean, maybe, but if you look in historics, even at tops, generally speaking, within two years, even if there is some sort of large recession, pullback in the market, et cetera, of say 20 to 30%, within that next two years, you're back at all time highs or above. Just look at what people are buying in 2021. You know, people are probably saying, oh, all time highs. And yes, we had a 20 to 30%, um, you know, decline in 2022. But guess what? Just in a short while longer in 2023, we, we came back to all time highs. I think a lot of people don't recognize if you look at the graphic mm -hmm. of the S&P 500, it's always at all-time highs. That's just the reality of life. And I don't think that people 
truly recognize that when you're investing in the S&P 500, you're investing in the ingenuity of America. You're investing in the fact that, uh, you know, these companies are going to continue to grow. And if it's not Apple, Google, Amazon, it's going to be some other company like NVIDIA that comes out of nowhere and grows quadruple or quintuple its market cap within a matter of a couple months. So um, I think a lot of people just, like they, like I said earlier, they don't know what they don't know or they're too short-term focused. Yeah. I'm more of a person that looks at things on a 10-year time horizon. And because uh, that's what I do. Oil and gas, these projects take me five to 10 years to really get moving. So, you know, that's just what I've kind of come come used to. So when I make an investment, it's generally speaking for the next five to 10 years. I saw, and first of all, you had a slight twang in your voice when you said America. You're like, America? Yeah, um, America, baby. I did pick that up. Uh, the second thing I picked up, you know, I, I saw this interesting uh, statistic, which had looked at all of the markets where the S&P 500 was up 10% in the first quarter of the year. And in every single one, except for 1987, it closed higher at the end of the year. And so we're going into an election. I think somebody did mention it here. Hold on. Uh, you know, election year, always a good time to ride the market up. I think with regards to the macro in general, you know, oil has other reasons to be jumping. I think there's some seasonality there. I mean, there's geopolitical events that are happening around the world that are affecting oil prices and you know, there's a fear around stagflation in general, where if inflation goes up and we have to maintain the rates as they are for longer, um, you know, there's going to be fewer cuts. I think at the beginning of the year, there were always there were even more bullish sentiments. Like, hey, there's going to be four cuts. Five. Like nobody's expecting it to go to two percent immediately, but that pace at which it gets reduced is essentially the the yardstick that the market is like that's going to be the delta between a hugely bullish 20 percent year for the spy or a five percent year for the spy or whatever it may be right it's are we telegraphing that we're going to have zero cuts three cuts five cuts whatever it may be right and so um i do think it's going to be a good year i don't i mean maybe it might be like a short like a top and we might not hit it for another month, maybe another two months. But I do think that we're going to be going higher um, and that all of these macro fears, so long as inflation still tracks down, which is the main thing, right? Like that's the main reason why we had this pullback. I think the pullbacks are healthy as well. <laughs> like I started and I know I know you know this, Matt, but, you know, I started my dividend portfolio in the beginning of mid-January and right now i'm like kicking myself saying why didn't i do this years earlier because not only is the portfolio up um you know significant way more than i expected in the first quarter of the year i'm also getting paid to hold those stocks and i'm not so naive to think that i'm a genius for picking the right dividend stocks it's just the whole market as a as a whole has been going up if you look at most stocks from january into now like that's just been going up. And of course, a pullback is normal in those circumstances, right? So anyways, that's my thought. I think we might have a pullback. Absolutely. I think it's healthy for us to do so. I think, you know, the market is definitely pricing in those three cuts, but I still think we're going to end the year higher because of all the tailwinds we have towards the second half of the year. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, I did share something, you know, just to give some people some context, right? So you know, I'm not saying that if you're looking at the market in a short term lens that you're right or wrong. This is just my perspective and how I look at things. The graphic that you're seeing here is the S&P 500 um, growth of a dollar. If you were to say have invested in 1926 and the different red and blue colors are associated with the different parties that are investing. Tell me when a bad time to invest in the S&P 500 might have been. Yeah, you could have caught an extra five or 10 percent. Um, and, and been able to get it. But to me, the market's always at all-time highs, if you look at this, right? This is a logarithmic right. scale. Um, what this right. is showing is money consistently going into the S&P 500, ca capital continuing to be investing in the top 500 companies in the United States uh, that are profitable, by the way. Um, 
So I think in that on its own is something to recognize. So it just kind of bothers me a little bit when people really, you know, and this is something I thought I knew, you know, I thought I, I thought I was smarter than the market. I thought I knew exactly what I was doing. And like, people are always like, ah, oh, bad time. It's, just, you know, I hear everyone say it. Everyone's just like, it's a bad time. It's just like, dude, it's always going to be, it's always going to be an awful time. Just always keep investing every single month. You know, I always hear about people trying to time the market. They think the market's high right now. They're, you're going to be investing when markets are high. You should be investing when markets are low. I mean, what what are you really investing for, right? I mean, if you're investing for tomorrow, then sure, don't invest. But you're investing for 10 to 15 years down the road or to to buy a, an island so me and Tevis can live there, um, which is my goal, then, you know, you got to be keeping investing. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Honestly, like this is the first quarter that I've ever been paid to hold stocks. Ah. And uh, it was it was a nice feeling. It was a nice feeling because I didn't. So I had the dividend reinvestment option ticked. And so I wasn't seeing any new money coming into the brokerage account. And just fractionally, every one of my positions was just like slightly increasing. And then only when I pull. And so to me, I, I thought. Like I didn't know, I didn't have alerts on for when the dividend came in, nothing, just. And so at the end of the month, you know, I said to myself, oh, like, I don't, I haven't even looked at the difference. I haven't even, you know, monitored this thing. And I pulled the report and I was like, holy, like there's, you know, 500 bucks extra here. That was a good feeling. It was a good feeling. And it's just, it gamified the experience for me. It made me want to put more in and you know, measure the growth of that portfolio in terms of saying like, oh, this is what I want my return to be for a year, so on and so forth. And I don't know, it's just like, I think the thing that really excited me maybe five years ago about the market, like just going in was finding that 10x. And that was like the really sexy thing to do. And I think the thing that is starting to excite me more and more is that snowball, like that compounding snowball aspect of saying like oh i can see the month over month of like what the reits are paying and every single month it's a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more because of the reinvestments because i'm consistently putting in you know every week every two weeks i'm putting in more money in those accounts and that's exciting to me now it's exciting but i because i came from that world I would just be cautious. And I think I've had this conversation with you, but I'd like, you know, you're bringing it up. And I think it's a, a good thing to maybe bring up to the public and, and your audience because nobody follows me, but a hundred people are following you here today. So, um, but the, the, the thing that I always recognize is that it's, it's addicting, right? That ability to have that snowball that, you know, that gentleman just mentioned is, is really something that you're like, Ooh, I can, it's tangible. I can see it. I can see it coming into the account. That's very addicting. I get that. The thing that you have to recognize is discipline. And this is, you know, you say the same thing about options. You could say the thing, same thing about dividends is discipline in making sure that you don't overdo it, right? Look for the companies that are innovating, but are also throwing out a dividend. Companies that are still reinvesting in themselves because you can invest in companies. And I love Steven to death, but companies like Altria Group, for example, you know, they're giving away, you know, as much as they can to the shareholders in the form of dividends. The capital appreciation just isn't there, right? And, you know, I could argue with, with Stephen about that back and forth. If he ever comes on the show, I'll gladly do it. But, you know, I like to find the sweet spot, right? I think Meta will probably do okay. Apple's done phenomenally. And people are like, oh, well, Apple doesn't pay much of a dividend. But it's like they're they're probably the largest dividend payer on the planet, um, maybe other than Saudi Aramco. And the reason being is even at a 1% yield, it's a $3 trillion market cap. So they're still paying $30 billion a year in annual dividends. The reason why it's 1% is because the stock has grown so fast so quickly. But I think the, the thing that you need to recognize is like, if the company is not innovating in itself and keeping up with the times, that will become the GE of let's just say 2024 and you know top 10 companies a lot of times fall out of favor for a reason they become mature they pay dividends they don't reinvest back into themselves they don't continue to innovate 
And that's what almost happened to Microsoft. Microsoft is a key example as to what happens when you don't innovate. Almost and happened then, to Microsoft. Yeah. And then if you turn around and you start to recognize you need to innovate back into your organization, obviously they kickstarted everything back up. And now yeah. they're arguably, you know, one of the most valuable brands in the world, um, you know, besides a Ramco or maybe Apple. But some, I guess right now they're probably larger than Apple. They're probably the largest stock in the they New are. York Stock Exchange. So, you know, it's a Microsoft is a beautiful example of yeah. what it's like if you just flounder and you don't reinvest in your company and you focus so much on buybacks and dividends and et cetera. And then he had luckily Satya Nadella come in and say, cloud is the way. And so there's, there's that. I want to touch on both of those because Apple and Microsoft are two large positions in the dividend portfolio. Apple is the biggest position in the dividend portfolio and Microsoft is the third largest position I have in there right now out of the total 24 positions. And it just feels like one of them is absolutely killing it. And the other one is just getting killed. Um, I don't know which one we want to start with. Maybe we start with Apple because there's less to cover there. I do want to jump into the Stargate news because I think it's really, I mean, Satya Nadella, CEO of the year, man, like, uh, or of the last trailing 12 months, like uh, everything that happened with the whole Sam Altman uh, thing and just OpenAI, his recent comments about OpenAI, like, you know, we're on top of it. We're all around them. We own all of that uh, IP and how they're going to integrate Stargate. We're, we're going to talk about that. I think Apple right now, from the outside looking in, it just seems like they're stumbling to find footing. I mean, did you see this recent news today that um, Bloomberg reported that they're exploring a home robotics project as the next big thing after the car division was essentially disbanded? Uh, so engineers at Apple have been exploring a mobile robot that can follow users around their home. I mean, this is coming at a time when, like, We've just been seeing so many Apple news in quick succession. Like, first of all, the car project, um, the DOJ uh, cases, the, the the Vision Pros and the, the weak sales in China. Um, so many pieces of news, like the whole Gemini, like Apple using Gemini as their AI engine. They bought an AI company, uh, a Canadian AI company. And it just seems as though, like, I think today, even the Apple Store, uh, the App Store was down along with some other services. I don't know, man. It just seems as though there that's being priced in. I think Apple's the worst performing of the the four mega caps, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Like they're down year to date. Um but they're probably the last so far in that race for AI and that race for innovation. You know, I think Amazon is killing it. I think Microsoft is definitely number one. Google. Um, you know, I know we talked about the the Gemini being woke and all that. I still don't like there's no there's been no evidence to disprove that, but they're still making moves. They're, they're I mean, even with the news that we had earlier today around them charging for some AI features, we can talk about that. And so every company, it seems, is making moves, but Apple, it seems, is struggling and their roadmap is unclear from an AI perspective. How are they going to innovate? You know, what I'm looking at, and I've been adding, I mean, what I've been looking at is the WWDC event. And don't forget, like Apple just buys back a ton of stock. Like they have a huge amount of cash flow. They just buy back a ton of stock. And so, you know, you could have done very, very well in Apple stock over the past five years, simply on the back of no innovation, simply on the back of Apple just buying back so much stock that mm -hmm. increases the stock price that it's beneficial for your dividends. And so, anyways, my point is, and yeah, like I, I agree with George. Like, I think that a lot of the pieces of news are nothing burgers by themselves. I think the wider question that it brings up, at least in my mind, I'm not sure about the wider market, is what is that cohesive vision? And where are they going? Like, where are they going to land in this race? They don't necessarily have to be first. I don't think they've ever been first in a new product launch. They've just done it better. They've come in second and they've improved on the gaps at the, you know, first place or 
new entrant has had, I don't know how easy that's going to be with AI because AI is so much faster paced than anything else. Number one, number two, we don't really have a clear vision for Apple right now. Like all we know is the the stale, uh, you know, stagnating sales for their hardware. I don't know where their innovation is going to come from, essentially. So once, of course, we have that direction, I'm sure the stock is going to rebound. It's the, you know, I think largest held uh, stock across the world. But I don't know. What do you make of all this? What do you make of Apple sort of stumbling their way into 2024, the stock being down um, and their roadmap being unclear? I think um, so. I'll just be blunt. Um I've been wrong on Apple for going on a decade. So, you know, when I say this, I come from a place of recognizing back in 2013, 2014, I said, why would you buy it? It's the largest company in the New York Stock Exchange. You know, it's stupid to own, et cetera. But even back then, Siri was a clunky punk piece of shit. Um, I literally woke up this morning. I have this brand new iPhone 15. I asked Siri to turn off my alarms four times and nothing fucking happened. So the fact that I hate to say it, right? Like I, I love the product. I use this phone every day. Um, you know, I've been, I had my iPhone XR for six years until I just recently got this iPhone. So in that respect, you know, the product works good yeah. enough, yeah. but to mean you mean to tell me that we're in 2024 and you can't even get Siri to turn off my alarm um, is pretty sad, right? Even my iPhone XR had the ability to, and it, it took a couple times most of the time. But if you're talking about having robotics following you around the house when you can't even have Siri turning off yeah. your alarm, it's pretty pathetic. So I just don't understand where where they think that they can. So I think that Apple has been phenomenal in terms of being able to build out their ecosystem. Uh, I think that uh, they, they've been valued heavily based off the fact for the buybacks, right? Um, they've been able to buy back probably, I forget how much of the float, but it's an absurd amount. And the majority of their 6X that has happened um, – Half of that has come from the fact that their earnings has increased. The other three X of that has happened because of the share buybacks. I think they've literally bought back two thirds of the float um, over the past 10 years. So I think that that's what a lot of it has been. The fact that they have a great product, you know, has, has made them what the number one in terms of market cap company within the United States stock market the thing that I'm struggling with just like you are is, is the phone going to be enough, right? It used to be enough to be the number one car manufacturer. It used to be enough to be the number one computer maker, Microsoft, right? It And then it came being the number one phone provider. Now it's cloud, you know, it, eventually it's going to be AI or biogenetics or, or something like that, robotics. So if you don't, if you can't even get Siri to work, then, you know, are you going to be left behind? Apple has been one of the top companies for many moons at this point. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't, I, I have a feeling that they'll be able to turn it around, but at the same time, I feel like they've been focusing on the easy wins. And now maybe the reason why they're, people are realizing that they're starting to flounder is because the easy wins are over for them. They've, they've been able to build out the services piece and I'm not saying it's a bad company, right? But they're starting yeah. to recognize now that revenues are starting to flatten yeah. and people, you know, aren't, you're getting kind of critical mass at this point with the phone. Um, and yeah. you need to find the next step up. So that way you can, can continue to, uh, to do well. So I would actually um, disagree in terms of the easy wins perspective because it, like the existing business lines are going to compound just normally as they grow. But it feels to me as though Apple is just going for, you know, knock it out of the park home runs and failing. Like the easy win 
from purely an innovation perspective would be fixing Siri, would be, you know, doubling down on the Vision Pro, figuring that out and not scatterbraining on all of these interesting projects that go nowhere. Like, I don't understand how you could have an ecosystem where consumers will literally buy, literally buy anything that you roll out and you haven't rolled out a new product line. I mean, Vision Pro, sure, you could argue, I, I would argue it's not even rolled out fully, like it's in beta, right? It's like the developer version. Um, and that's that's definitely the thing that I'm looking at to say, okay, this could be some new product. This could be the new Apple Watch, the new thing that's going to give them multiple billions of dollars of revenue per year. And everybody's going to adopt this because of the demand being so high. But now with the software aspect of AI, it just seems like every other company is running with this. They have some competition. They have a horse in that race. And Apple just, it seems like they don't. And while I am bullish on the Vision Pro, you know, from an innovation perspective, again, I still think that I don't know if it's going to be enough to keep them maintaining their position on the podium where they stand, right? And so it just feels as though the introduction of chat GPT and open AI, like it just has changed the landscape somewhat. And it's brought that AI piece into mainstream, into the prime time. And that's going to change the the rankings. And so Apple coming out with Vision Pro, it's like, that's great. But this was the, you know, this was the innovation piece that everybody was looking at when Meta changed their name, when Facebook changed their name to Meta, when, when was it, 2021, something like that. That's where everybody was looking at the augmented reality space and how that's going to look from an advertising perspective and so on and so forth, a new app store. And now everybody's looking at AI. And while I'm saying that the Vision Pro could go head to head with Oculus and maybe even it could win out that race, let's just say maybe, although it's definitely up for debate, Apple doesn't have a horse in that AI race. And so the Vision Pro alone is not going to be enough from an innovation perspective to keep them. It might be enough to keep them in the game so that they don't go the way of, you know, IBM or somebody like that. But it definitely won't be enough to keep them, you know, top three biggest companies in the world. Yeah, I think um, the phone needs to either add additional capability or, and that could be that could be AI, right? I mean, that that could be a piece of it where they have a step change in the capability of the AI within the phone itself, and maybe that's working with Gemini or who knows. But um, I'm with you. I just I've been thinking about it for a while, you know. But like I said, this is coming on the back of me thinking that Apple can't do it for the last five years. And here they have been able to, to do really, really well. Um, so I've obviously lost out um, on returns because of my disbelief in Apple and they've been able to prove me wrong. So I have a feeling they're going to continue to do it because I've been over the past five, 10 years been like, I don't know how they do it and they continue to. So. I hope they do. I mean, that's why I've been adding. It's because their track record in the past, they've always managed to pull something out. But at the same time, I mean, the market votes on these things in real time. And right now, it seems as though the you know favorite, so to speak, is Microsoft. And it makes sense, right? So we can jump into the Stargate news. I don't, do you own, you own Microsoft, right, Matt? Like as an individual name? Not an individual name. Um, I own... It in Spy and in TQQQ, okay. um, but the only Magnificent Sevens that I do own outright are Amazon and Google. Okay, so we're like the the total opposite because I own Apple and Microsoft, not just for the dividends, right? That's yeah. the reason why I own them because I do think that Amazon. I saw this piece of news. I even retweeted it that Amazon was like not paying out big bonuses anymore. And I even tweeted saying, like, can we see a dividend coming soon? Um, I do think a lot of the other companies are going to take a page out of Meta's book and introducing that dividend, whether it is Amazon and or Google this year. But um, yeah, earlier this week, many senior Amazon employees won't get cash raises this year. Amazon senior managers and other senior leaders um, won't receive cash pay raises so either um 
it's going to be in the form of buybacks or it's going to be in the form of maybe dividends. I think those are the main speculations right now. Uh, it's going to be interesting. But yeah, so I own Apple and Microsoft. You own Amazon and Google. Microsoft is working with OpenAI. They're discussing this project Stargate. This is a $100 billion investment into a supercomputing cluster that can essentially support future AI models. So think, you know, GPT-5, future versions, whatever it may be, they need more compute. And Microsoft is heavily investing in this, um, more so, much more so than their previous investments in, in data centers. And really, I think it just... It just goes to show their commitment uh, to that space. And I think Satya Nadella has been really on the ball with all of the moves that he's made all throughout the past 12 months. And, you know, it's evident where a lot, I mean, even Elon tweeted about this today where he was saying that uh, OpenAI is like poaching their top talent for AI specifically. Um, so just, just wondering if uh, you have any thoughts on that. I know you don't own them, but. Just curious. I don't know them, and I think they they do a great job, right? I, I think it's remarkable how they've mm -hmm. been able to continue to grow their cloud platform by 30% per annum. Um, and I feel confident that they'll be able to do well because their upselling ability is absolutely phenomenal. So going from just something like Power BI being released, you know, however many moons ago to right. now having Office 365 as a subscription model rather than having to upgrade every year. I mean, things like that, where they're able to just continue to leverage, you know, enterprise and and, and making sure that it's more seamless on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is they've done really well with it. Um, and so I think that they're going to continue to do well. I, I see a lot of businesses starting to utilize Copilot as well. Right. Um, and, and, and so the, they have these opportunities where they're able to almost like they have everybody's feet in their or hands in their pocket now, or they have maybe their hands in everybody else's. So they can just say for five dollars more a month per user or whatever, you can right. get X, Y and Z. And, you know, it's a slow ad but that five dollars will turn into fifteen dollars, will turn into 20 and. Right. Eventually, that that small little add-on will will be able to, um, you know, generate literally billions of dollars. Then you add a multiple of fifteen to thirty x on every billion dollars extra of revenue and, and net income. You're talking, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap generation just by adding a one or two small little features. So, I think they do a phenomenal job. Um, I think they their their ability to stay at the forefront of of artificial intelligence has been really good. Um, I think that they have a lot of other side businesses that have done extremely well, like the gaming side. Um, and I don't think people give them enough credit for what they've been able to accomplish uh, as an entirety of an enterprise and mm -hmm. how they've turned it around really in, in just nine to 10 years. Um, you know, they were a 450, $500 billion company right. about 10 years ago, and they've been able to six X, since that point to be a $3 trillion company um, because of that, you know, I feel kind of silly because at one point I did own Microsoft at $52 um, and I had about 20 shares and I would be sitting on, you know, it wouldn't have been that much, but you know, it'd be a nice little chunk of change and I'd have some dividends. I probably would have reinvested it and, you know, um, it is what it is, but I don't know what I ended up, buying with the with the proceeds of that but it just goes to show you when you when you think of things sort of short term right. you might make the wrong decisions and at the time it was strictly a dividend play it wasn't really a growth play back then because of just where it was i think it was like 2014 2015 so um yeah i know i didn't probably answer your question directly but no, I think you bring up some good points. And, you know, the thing to consider also about Microsoft and all of these companies, two things. Number one, I think OpenAI is the most accessible just because they had a first mover's advantage in that space. And I know, you know, for my company, for example, it's a software as a service company. They plug in, like we plug into GPT. And so many of our clients also plug into GPT for their own use cases as a just a wrapper around it, or they add the context and then GPT is the the engine 
I think they have everybody's feet to the fire to be able to raise that price consistently because people like there's an opportunity cost. There's a sunk cost there essentially of people going into their tech infrastructure again and then rerouting this with uh, something else. There's also nothing else quite mature enough in the market to be a direct competitor right now. Like Copilot has its own use cases. I get it but it's not as mainstream as the GPT is. And so Microsoft have a real first movers advantage with regards to that. Number one, number two is you have to consider their ecosystem, right? I also saw this piece of news this week that uh, as a result of, uh, I might get this wrong, but as a result of some antitrust lawsuits that they were forced to decouple teams and, you know, basically the, the conclusion that I got out of that is that, Microsoft Teams is like dead now because the entire reason that they gained so much steam over Slack, Slack was a better product offering, but Teams was bundled in for free for a lot of these deals into that suite for enterprise. And so Teams gained adoption. It could very easily be the same model for something like a chat GPT for whatever else they decide to roll out because they already have that ecosystem. And so they can bundle it in and then increase the entire price of the bundle and they're still coming out on top. Not wrong. Okay. So um, you did mention something interesting, though, which was the increasing the price of the subscription, starting with 5, going to 10, going to 15. And the reason why it's interesting is because earlier today, Google, um, an article dropped that Google was considering charging for premium features powered by artificial intelligence um, that would be making a shift into its business model for search so my understanding is that essentially if you want to have an ai powered search feature it would be like a subscription service that you would pay google and google's normal search engine would be free ads would appear alongside the search results but if you want this to be AI powered, then you would have to pay some some subscription. Did I understand that more or less correctly? So the thing that I didn't know, I did see the headline. Mm. Do you know if it's specifically for public or did you know notice if it was specifically for enterprise? Um, because I am kind of curious. I could see where you know having an enterprise might be more uh, useful to do something like that. Um, and especially if you can integrate maybe some more proprietary stuff. I mean, this is a lot what like Palantir is doing with, with their artificial intelligence platform or AIP, which is like, you're able to kind of couple proprietary um, models within your organization with more public data, like weather and, and other traffic patterns that might be useful for say logistics to help you. But what I'm not 100% certain at the moment is how Gemini is really getting in more depth other than small tasks. You know, at the moment, I haven't really seen Gemini being utilized or, or AI from, from Google or anything like that being utilized for enterprise, really. It's mostly mm -hmm. just been consumer focused. And so to me, you know, I think that people have always wondered, like searches or like started to say search is dead, search is dead. To right. me, I think that even if you have AI or a Bard or now Gemini, right. um, you know, like you stated, you can just have ads right in between um, everything that you look at, right? Just like how you're on Snapchat, there's ads, Instagram, there's ads, Facebook, there's ads. You're pretty much in the same sort of prompt, right, screen as you have with, with Google and Google search. What's to say that there's not going to be advertisements within there right just like right. when websites first came out they used to just be big blank white canvases now they're coupled with massive amounts of uh banner ads and stuff like that you can't escape them so this is going to be a different means to be able to get advertisements so to me maybe you could have like a youtube premium has been something that's really taken off so maybe there's like a a Gemini premium that doesn't have the advertisements. And maybe that's something that people will be more willing to pay, you know, for, for no advertisements and they, they don't have to be bothered, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 
the way that Google search works right now with advertising that Gemini is not going to be the same exact way within two to three years. Well, so remember, I mentioned the ecosystem effect, and that's very prevalent in Google. I think this article from Financial Times or whoever reported it was also mentioning that this AI powered search as part of the subscription, this premium subscription would also be this Gemini AI assistant in your Gmail in your Google Docs, in your entire sort of drive, right? All your Google apps. And so, you know, I, I do think that this is like, this strategy is tried and true, right? Like they want to offer something for free to gain broad adoption and capture the most market share, and then eventually monetize the shit out of it. And it happens with like the ad platform, like you're gonna get a heavier and heavier ad load, or you're gonna move towards a subscription and paying, or, it's gonna, I mean, it's gonna happen with AI too, right? Like they're gonna introduce it for free, make it so accessible and so easy for you to use. You can't say no to it. It's right in your face and it's totally free to use. And then eventually after they capture that market share and after they gather all of that data from you entering all those prompts in, they're gonna slowly start to increase it, right? So Google's looking to do that. Microsoft is looking to do that. They're all looking to do that. Yep. Um, okay. Last thoughts, just so, I mean, we're at the one hour mark. Um, maybe you can talk for two minutes about Rocket Lab and uh, and then we can wrap. How does that sound? Uh, you know, I'd rather switch to a different topic. I mean, I'll give it a minute elevator pitch and then maybe we can talk about one other topic that maybe is more interesting to you. But I think a lot of people are probably thinking that Rocket Lab fits in with a lot of these other uh, heavy capitalized companies that have been around for the last five to six years that unfortunately have gone boom or bust um, and mostly have been bust. Um, Rock Lab has been successful in launching small launch vehicles since 2017 timeframe that were around since 2006 um, and has continued to, to utilize capital from their SPAC period to uh, uh, acquire multiple um, space systems companies like solar um trackers satellite creators you know etc and they've they've done a really good job with it thus far and if, if anybody is going to be successful these guys are the number two in the space in terms of um being able to launch um they've launched 46 uh successful uh, rockets to space not all of them have been successful operations but they've had 46 successful launches uh, at this point. And so, um, you know, almost 200 satellites deployed to space, you know, they do a pretty damn good job of it. They're on the precipice of, of testing some of their medium launch capabilities, which is going to go head to head with the Falcon nine. So, I mean, to me, it, I talked to this conversation, I had this conversation with Chris Patel, which is a good, a good pushback, right? People that are risk averse, right? This is probably not the company for you. It's still, still burning cash, you know, but the thing is, is you're in a zip code now where companies either go bankrupt or they go to $200 billion if you're SpaceX. Um, this is the second most successful of these companies and it's $2 billion, maybe even less now. So I don't want to say you're going to $200 billion, but even if you get a quarter of the way there, you're going from 1.75 to two, from 2 billion ish to 50 billion. The 20 to 25 X. And so I'm willing, you know, just based off my due diligence to gamble a hundred thousand dollars on it. And I feel like I'm going to be very successful. And I feel like in the future, you know, it'll be hindsight 2020, um, a very wise investment. These guys have been extremely successful um, being able to bootstrap their way when many other people like Bezos and Elon have been able to, utilize capital it's not to say elon you know just threw money at the problem right elon's done phenomenal right so i don't want to discredit or devalue anything that he's done but these guys have done it on a fraction of the budget and have been successful and uh, are continuing to win more and more contracts from space force etc um and they're gonna almost double their revenue from last year and next year once they get neutron up and running i feel like they're gonna almost grow it by about 200%. So I'll just stop there. But um, anybody that's risk averse, stay away. There's a lot of 
capital exposure still, but within the next 12 months, um, I would anticipate you'll start to see the company either be uh, EBITDA break even and eventually get themselves to a place where their their cash flow break even, and then the stock price will really start to move within the next 24 months. I think that was a great pitch. <laughs> I mean, very concise. I mean, you laid out the opportunity. Um, do you want to have one last topic? And if so, you're choosing it. Oh, man. Uh, tell us about your fancy dividends. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been talking a little bit about throughout, but it's the portfolio that I've been investing the most actively into. I feel like if I don't have that habit of consistently putting money in the dividend account, then I would just be buying SoFi and Tesla so much more heavily. And I don't think that's necessarily healthy with the position that I already have in those companies. It's a, a huge percentage of my portfolio. And so the dividend is something that it's good habits for me. It's good consistency. I like to get into that rhythm of, you know, every couple of weeks you're buying uh, these dividend companies. What I'm finding right now is that there is some slight bias that is playing a role because I find myself adding to certain companies that I like more. And so as a result, I'm like I get skewed and the dividend yield gets affected by that. And so one of the things that I'm coming back to is trying to add consistently, regardless of the name, just equal share across the board. And on what day is it today? Wednesday, I think on Monday, uh, I put, I bought like, you know, seven or eight companies in that dividend portfolio. I just bought more of them. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. Like whether it's red or, or green or whatever, I just wanted to get in that habit. And um, yeah, I, I think it's, like I said before, it's something that I'm getting more bullish on. It's gamified in my mind and it's exciting for me just to see the progress I'm making, you know? And are you willing to disclose about how much? I think you shared it on Twitter, so hopefully it's not. So <laughs> the I, dividends, I, not not the total value, but well, I mean, you 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 already know the yield, and so if you know the dividends, you'll you'll know the total value too. Um, so I made about five hundred bucks uh, in Q one oh, off yeah. of the dividends alone. Um, right now, that portfolio is about a hundred k. Uh, but I just started in January, so I'm actively adding to it. I added quite a bit in Q1, um, so we'll see how far it goes. But again, right now, like that entire portfolio is not like my entire Tesla position is like you know equivalent, if not bigger, uh, yeah. than that portfolio. So uh, you know, it's uh, it's nice right now. I just like the consistency of it. I expect that portfolio to be significantly larger this time next year just because you know every couple of weeks i'm putting money away and i'm really judging it more by that snowball aspect and less so by that you know this needs to yield 20 percent or 30 percent or whatever it's i really enjoy just getting that payday at the end of the day right and just watching that just get reinvested yeah, that's that's really good. I, I got I got really addicted to dividends myself when I first started really focusing on them. Um, yeah, I've I've stepped. I think I told you this. I've stepped back pretty significantly from how much I invest in strictly dividend income. Um, but even still, just as a byproduct of investing in the S and P and and a few other companies like Nextera, um, and and just a few other companies that I have within the portfolio. Uh, I was fortunate to make about 5,000 in dividends in the first quarter. Um, a lot of that, I think, let me see, what's my spy position? Insane, that. Yeah, I know. It's it's pretty crazy. And the fact, the fact that that's like pulling back, right? Um, I mean, I have, I can actually share a chart if anybody's actually interested. I used to share, share a lot of this shit. Yeah, do it. Um, but this is... Um, the dividends of by month that I used to get. Uh, see if I can zoom in here, and you can see, you know, more recently that it's pulled back a good bit. But 
you can see it used to be a lot of year-over-year -year growth, and then in 2023, you start seeing the negative growth because I started selling a lot of it. But it, at some points, I was actually getting close to $4,000 in a single month from certain companies. Um, and that was kind of the goal was to like get $2,000 a month guaranteed, $3,000 a month guaranteed. And at one point, I was most of the months were above 2000 in the 2021, 2022 timeframe. And I was getting pretty happy about that because obviously, you know, that's close to 28,000, 24 to $30,000 a year. And if I calculate, yeah, so 20, this is, it moved pretty quick. In like 2019, I made about 8,900. 2020, I made about 15,000. 2021, I made about 23,000. And then 2022, which is actually when I started pulling back a good bit. I was on track, I think, to make over like twenty eight or twenty nine thousand. Then it's when I was kind of just like, "What am I going to do with all these dividends? I'd rather invest it in companies like Palantir and and things like that." And it was actually the right time to do that because a lot of these companies pulled back a pretty significant bit. Right. Um, and so even still, I made close to twenty seven thousand then, and last year I made close to twenty three thousand. So I think this year I'm on track because I sold more, even more companies. Whoop, I do not want to share that. Um, uh, to be probably close to like 20 or 21,000. Um, and a lot of that's just because I sell certain companies. Like I sold Pepsi. I was making about, I don't know if it was 1,000 or I had 200 shares of Pepsi. So I guess that's... I remember when you sold that. It was there. close to $1,000 a year. And I sold that and I moved it to the SPY. So that kind of decreases the income generated from that capital by about 50% because Pepsi was yielding about 25 to 3% dividend yield, and the SPY only really yields about 1.5%, maybe slightly yeah. less. So, But my goal is eventually to get to a place where I'm yielding about ten or so thousand dollars a quarter, specifically yeah. from SPY alone. I mean, I'd like to have like a two, two and a half million dollar position in SPY. Uh, that's kind of the hope. Um, and then the rest of the portfolio is going to be what the rest of the portfolio is, real estate, et cetera. But yeah. um, it, it have, I definitely have a, a way to go because I think my SPY position, and this doesn't include 401k and stuff like that, but SPY alone is about 500 shares. Um, if I continue to consolidate some positions, it'll probably grow to um, – you know, probably closer to a thousand within the next couple of years. That's kind of where I want to be, but eventually I want to, you know, get it closer to, to two, two and a half million dollars worth. And by that point, I think the spy position will probably be pretty full and then I can focus on investing in other stuff. That's one of the things that I've been thinking about as well is, oh, sh well, should I invest in these individual names or should I consolidate a lot of the positions and start to build a QQQ or a spy position. I mean, both of those pay a dividend, right? So I don't know. It's a it's a thought in my mind. I think right now, like it's such a baby portfolio that I can run with individual names for quite a bit. And then when it gets scary or at some point or another, instead of reinvesting in those same names, I can just get all the dividends and I can reinvest them in spy. I can reinvest them in whatever I want. And that's cool, right? Because I, I really like that con that prospect of creating new positions from from scratch like let's say you know let's say i can get it to a point where where you are for example where you're making 20 some odd thousand dollars a year just on dividends well all of a sudden like if you wanted to build out a palantir position this year your dividends can pay for that if you wanted to build a rocket lab position that you think that's going to 10 or 20x well if you just dedicate all of your dividends for the entire year to rocket lab then that's 20K that can go to, you know, 400K potentially, right? And so that money just materializes out of your dividends. So instead of doing the drip, reinvesting in the existing dividend positions, just to snowball it even further, you could repurpose that dividend cash into some more risky stuff and have that as your bet. Or if I want to do like leaps on SoFi or whatever it may be, like I can do a lot of that stuff risk-free, relatively risk-free because the dividends can foot that bill and mm -hmm. i think that's a really a really interesting and attractive value proposition in my mind because you can get like the both best of both worlds a little bit right
Yeah, it's well, I was kind of in your your boat, you know, because it wasn't that long ago, right? I mean, um, you know, it was within the last five or so years. I mean, my original thought was I wanted to get to a place where I was making even just a thousand dollars a quarter, right? I mean, right. that 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 would get me tight in the shorts, right? I got I was all about that. And then really it got to the point where I was like, okay, well, if I can get to a thousand dollars a month even at that mm. point, like you stated, I you know, I add aggressively, you know, it's my hobby, right? So some people might buy jet skis, I invest in the stock market. Um, you know, so I'm adding thousands upon thousands of dollars a month. Yeah. So if I'm able to then just use that additional thousand dollars and like you stated, uh add it to the other thousand dollars or so that I'm adding every single month, then like you stated, like it, it, it could really supercharge things. Uh, or if I just wanted it to be its own little entity, I can do that, right? It, it adds that flexibility to the portfolio. But the hope was eventually, you know, just get to a place where your spy alone is throwing off so much in dividends that you could literally retire from that. And then if you want to do other things like invest in other stocks, options, trading, real estate, et cetera, you have that capability. Right. Um, and you're still invested in 500 very profitable companies and it's literally guaranteed by the um, by the people that maintain the S&P 500. Yeah, I think what I'm excited about most is just to see the progress, right? That's the thing that gets me excited is not necessarily, I mean, time flies, man. I still feel like I'm just getting started in investing and I've been in the market now for like six years, seven years, <laughs> which is crazy to me because that that blows my mind alone. Uh, I feel so old. And the thing with this dividend portfolio, I just say, okay, well, I'm going to put in as much as I can this year. And I want to see how much I can manage to yield, right? If I am making, you know, let's say 500 bucks in dividends this first quarter, my goal is to make 700 bucks in dividends in Q2, 900 bucks in dividends in Q3, 1,000 bucks in dividends in Q4. That's going to require me aggressively depositing money, but it's like, hell, I've already been doing that. And I would have done that regardless, whether it's in SoFi, Tesla, Celsius, whatever, or whether it's in the actual dividend account, it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. but it's also a way to become more risk averse and feel more comfortable making a lot of those aggressive bets in the growth portfolio because I know that I have like a almost like a compounding machine on the side that just goes regardless of my actions on the growth side of things. And so I can split that focus a little bit and I can still have the consistent habit of reinvesting. I mean, a lot of people just do this in the spy. They buy a little bit of the index every month. You know, I select 24 different companies and I buy a little bit of those every month and I can switch in and out of them. Sure. Periodically, but that keeps like the money's going to go into the market regardless. Um, it's, it's going to happen similar to you. It's, it's a hobby. It's an, whatever you may call it. I live fairly frugally. You know, I don't do any extravagant shit. I go on vacation whenever I want to go on vacation. Um, I go wherever I want. I don't really care about that as you know, but when it comes to everything else, like I don't have like an extravagant, expensive lifestyle. And so the money is going to go into the account regardless. By having the dividend account there, I have a safe avenue to deploy that money so that I don't force myself to always go so deep, so heavy. Like I don't want to have, um, you know, a half a million dollar SoFi position or whatever it may be, because it's just you get to that place where it's so concentrated into, you know, one or two bets that, I don't know, it's just, it's really. cool. Yeah, I think the, the beauty of it is, is something as simple as this, which is like, your run, your run rate's about $2,000 a year at the moment without any further investment, which is badass as fuck, right? So let's just say you get 5%. You, let's just say you have a 5% yield. I know you might have less than that. I don't know most of the stocks that you're invested in, but let's just say you have a 5% yield. Just by reinvesting in that um, $2,000 that you're going to get, you're going to get an additional $100 a year in dividend income. 
which is pretty badass if you think about it, because you're just reinvesting two thousand dollars, you're gonna get an additional hundred dollars uh, a year in annual income. But then also, generally speaking, a lot of these companies they're investing in are aggressive um, dividend raisers, and yeah. that alone they'll they'll likely raise five to ten percent. But let's just be conservative and say it's another five percent. So that alone next year with just reinvesting your dividends and without any adding any additional capital coupled with the dividend raises that you're going to get, you're going to make $2,200 a year just in dividends just next year um, without even having to really add any additional capital to the portfolio. And that's part of the beauty of it is like it self feeds itself to an extent where I don't think people really recognize. And then you start adding up Say you yeah. get to the $20,000 a year range. Now you're talking about going from, you know, $20,000 a year to $22,000 without any additional capital, right? I mean, that's an additional couple hundred bucks a month. That'll pay for a cell phone bill. That'll help pay for a car. That'll help them do whatever. Yeah. It's, it's really, like, well, uh, really expensive. Like $20,000 a year pays my rent in Toronto. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then I just think to myself, my career is at a place where I'm still compounding what I bring home every year. Like every year I have a goal on myself to bring home more in take home than I had the previous year. Every year I've hit that goal and I'm sure as hell I'm going to plan to hit that goal this year as well because of all the other things I do. Like I work multiple jobs and I do this on the side and, you know, all of that, all those efforts compound. And so I think to myself, okay, well, what if I could get to a place where, you know, my dividend portfolio pays my rent and all of a sudden I reduce that expense. And by that time I'm even making more money. Well, then all of a sudden you're not depositing 70% of your take home to the market. You're depositing 90% or, or whatever it may be. And so it snowballs really heavily because you're, you're tackling it from two sides you're increasing your passive income while at the same time reducing your expenses while at the same time increasing your active income. And it's just, you know, that's the really exciting part for me because, I mean, again, for me, I just want to see progress. And that progress is exciting because it motivates me to work hard, harder, because progress begets more progress. Hmm. You're an impressive man. Is that, is that an appropriate place to end it? What do you think? I think so. I think you did a good job, man. Um, 20K a, rent, a year for rent. Tevi likes his nice nice apartment. It's Yeah, it's like right in the heart of Toronto. I can literally see the CN Tower from my window right here as I'm looking. Um, it's Toronto prices are fucking bananas. And yeah, that's just how it is. If and when I move to the States, that's going to be less. Um, but first of all, somebody has to sponsor my ass to get to the States. So you guys feel free to reach out to Anthony Noto. Uh, I'll fly down, do an interview with him, and then I'll also hand in my job application uh, for product roles. Everybody, this has been the Bootleg Weekly Podcast. Follow Matt Money. He has a channel. I think you go live every night with Chris on Cashflow Chronicles? Uh, not, not every night. We try. Um, tonight I did Bootleg Weekly, and I think... I think we're trying to give a little bit more pace to mm -hmm. the uh, to it. So I think we're going to try to do two nights a week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, unless Chris uh, wants to bug me more and, and do more, which I'll always welcome. But um, either Chris is on a vacation or I'm on a vacation. But, uh, yeah, we did one last night, and uh, we're, we're in the process of monetizing a separate channel, um, which should hopefully be in the next week or so. So Matt, it's genuinely always a pleasure to have you on. And yeah, man, we got a we got a we got a plan. You know what I'm talking about. We got a plan. Yes, sir. Thanks everybody for watching, and I'll see you next week. Guys, have a good night.